I'm the most dangerous person of all, you know, because when you feel like you're okay, you think you're okay. And it's actually the opposite. By the time you realize that you have it, you know, you've already passed it to eight to 15 people, you know, and I think that that's the biggest, it's this, like, we've got to think differently. It's no longer okay to only think about us. Hello, and welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast where each week we talk about ideas for raising kids who become thriving adults. I'm your host, Audrey Monkey. Here on the podcast, I share my experiences raising five kids who currently range in age from 16 to 26 and working with thousands more as a summer camp director over the past three decades. I'm the author of Happy Campers, and I frequently do workshops with parents, teachers, and summer camp professionals about social skills, connection, and happiness, topics I researched extensively for my master's in psychology. If you want tools for raising kind, optimistic, self-reliant kids who become thriving adults, you've come to the right place. Hey, Sunshine Parenting listeners. This is episode 147, which is first being released on Friday, July 10th, 2020. This week's one simple thing tip is to explore the concept of flow, either just for yourself or for your entire family. Flow is a term coined by psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. It refers to this state of optimal experience and involvement or engagement with an activity when we are just feeling so engaged that we lose track of time. We each experience flow in different ways. Sometimes it's while playing a musical instrument or doing some kind of sport or writing or painting or doing some other creative thing or attending a concert or bird watching, running, riding a horse. It can be just any way. It's different for each person. Sometimes we can't even relate to what puts other people in flow because it's so different from what we get engaged and enthusiastic about. If you want to really see great flow, watch very young kids at play when they're just doing free play and pretending and building things and creating things. The younger we are, the better we are at getting into flow. If you haven't really felt that feeling of being in flow lately, one way to try to gain it again is to think back to around the age of maybe 11 or 12 and think about what activities you used to really enjoy then. It could be that you might still enjoy those same activities now. I know when I was that age, I was really starting to enjoy photography. I also enjoyed sewing and calligraphy and some other creative endeavors. I liked writing in my journal. Really, all of those things I can still do as an adult, and I can still enjoy. I tried lettering over this past week or so, and I'm really enjoying kind of revisiting that calligraphy idea that I used to enjoy as a younger child. So I encourage you to think about activities that can put you in flow, and maybe encourage your family to explore different activities and things that they really enjoy. Because getting into that great state of engagement and flow really improves our well being. My guest this week on the podcast is Jill Stribling. She has a BA in child development and psychology and a master's degree in education with a specialty in literacy and language arts from California State University. She has more than 20 years experience in education, and after several years teaching in public schools in Los Angeles, she was recruited by the American School of Madrid back in 2001, where she taught kindergarten and first grade and took on several leadership roles. With her educational and professional experience firmly in place, she developed a methodology for making language learning fun and began her entrepreneurial journey in 2008 with literally one student in her living room. Shortly afterwards, Jill had a total of 70 students and actually had to expand her business. English for Fun is an educational group with an English enrichment program for children and adults, an urban camp program, 
an American Early Childhood Center, and a training center for educators. Today, Jill owns schools in Madrid and Pozuelo de Alarcón, and this year alone, more than 3,000 students will benefit from the English for Fun method. I first met Jill several years ago when she came to tour my camp. Later, she started sending her children, Nico and Olivia, and I've known her family now for several years. I even had the opportunity to visit Jill and her family in Madrid back in 2017 and do some speaking with the parents at her schools. If you're a longtime listener to Sunshine Parenting, you may remember Jill from back in episode 35 when we talked about her decision to unplug her family and the positive behavioral changes she saw in her son, who was 10 years old at the time. I reached out to have Jill back on the podcast this week because her family has personally experienced COVID. She and her family live in Madrid, Spain, which was hard hit by the coronavirus and put on full lockdown starting in March. In this conversation, we talk about how she's doing now and how it's going with her schools starting to reopen in Madrid. Enjoy this conversation with Jill Stripling. So today on the podcast, I have a returning guest, Jill Stribling. Welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me. So Jill, just remind my listeners where you are and what you do. Okay, well, I'm a huge listener of yours as well, just so you know. So this is really exciting for me to be here. I am in Madrid, Spain, and I'm an American who moved here many years ago, 18 years ago, for a job at the American School of Madrid, and I left the American School to open my own schools. So I have schools called English for Fun. They're American preschools. They're um, now virtual academies as well, where we do STEAM learning, summer camps, all kinds of different things, but everything that we do is was, up until COVID, urban. And our online program started as a part of fulfilling a need for our families and then families throughout the world who needed some online options to do. But yeah, I'm here in Madrid. So uh, with my two kids yes. and my husband. Yes, you are. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is because um, I think you have a, a very different perspective than a lot of other people about COVID. Um, So why don't you tell a little bit about your family's experience with COVID? Okay. So, so my husband and I, you know, I'm, I'm 45. He is 48. I believe I'm really bad about that, but uh, we're, we're a middle-aged, but healthy, very healthy couple. Um, We are very active. We do, you know, we, we have a very active lifestyle and um, in early February, mid-February, when everything started to hit. First, we heard about COVID in China, and it was there for quite some time, and it wasn't such a, a big deal and, because it wasn't close to us. And then it landed in Italy, and we still kept thinking, oh, man, you know, we love Italy. We love the fun that, that happens in Italy, but we kept thinking, oh, man, okay, it's going to stay there. And then there were a few big events in about mid-February, and where people had traveled to come where there was sporting events, there was a huge art fair, all of these things. And, um, and then it came to Madrid. And during this process, uh, right before lockdown, my husband was not feeling well. I kind of felt like I had a little cough and didn't feel too great, but I'm always in front of the public, you know, and so, and I work inside of a school and so we're used to a lot of different germs that that kind of come towards us but um you know i just assumed that it's probably a normal cold you know and and just kept going and kept working and kept doing all of these things and february is our very busy season so we take uh, our families to a huge event called arco for fun and that's where our families learn about art so when they see our children's art show then they it doesn't look like weird contemporary art stuff and um i'm assuming that, that that's where my husband came in contact with um, with 
somebody with COVID. And at the time it was still incubating here. And so nobody really knew or understood what was going on. And then I'll be honest, basically every day has been like seven since, uh, but around March 13th, my husband, you know, we, we the schools, we, I own schools and everything went on lockdown in Spain and it was 24 hours, make your decisions, get yourselves in home, uh, at home and that's it. And about four days before that, my husband had already quarantined himself inside of our house, but we had to keep going because we kind of knew this was coming and we were we were getting ready to take all of our programs and and just in case react and, and get and make sure everything was okay for kids and so my husband is self-quarantined may 13th uh spain closed it was either the 11th or the 13th spain closed and uh, a week later Wait. on the day that you uh, just said may but it was march oh march yeah. excuse me march third march 11th or march 13th i can't remember the school lockdown because i gauge everything based on kids and so school lockdown happened and uh five days later i had to take my husband to the hospital because he you know he was feeling sick and he kind of thought that he had it and he kept calling the hospital and they were saying just stay put quarantine yourself you know if you don't have a fever, then you're stay home, you know, or if you, you get to a point where you can't breathe, then you need to go to the hospital. Well, he got to a point on the same day that we had to give the news to our staff that we had to lay everyone off and, and everything was closed and Spain basically just went in a tailspin. I had to take him to the hospital that same day and he was diagnosed with COVID immediately. They took him from me and they put him, I'm probably going to cry, but they put him in the hospital. And I will tell you that it is probably the scariest thing that has ever happened to me, to my family, the last hundred and I don't know, now we're at 110 days since this all began, but 103 days, we, the kids were in lockdown. But, I, and I'm pretty risky, I'm American, I like to move abroad. I think that this was the scariest thing that I've ever been through in my entire life. Um, David was hospitalized for a week. We were really, really lucky that, um, you know, that we sent him to the hospital before the big wave happened. And so he got sick right at the very beginning before it had really hit Spain. And, um, you know, it was March 18th when he went into the hospital and about the 24th is when people just started going. I mean, it was just everywhere, you know? And so he was in the hospital and he was there for a week and doing all these experimental drugs to get him out of what he was. So he, we were really lucky that he recovered in a week, but it was based on a cocktail of medicine that they gave him when they were still in the experimental phase. And, um, you know, and then from there he had to be quarantined inside of our home because they needed to get him out of the hospital. They needed a bed. And so by the time he was getting out of the hospital is when the massive boom happened in Spain that, that you saw. And we're in Madrid, which was the epicenter of COVID for, for Spain. And, and literally it all happened so fast, but, um, you know, being faced with the fact, I'm going to cry, sorry, but being faced with the fact that my kids almost lost their dad was, was really hard. And, you know, we did the best that we could. I mean, it was everything. It was the economy crashing. I'm a business owner. He is a business owner. It was, you know, are our children going to be okay now they don't have school. So I have to learn how to homeschool, you know, I mean, it was everything all at once. And then to put him into the hospital, you know, I think that now looking back on it, we realize, you know, how crazy everything was and how fortunate we are. But, um, but yeah, it was not easy. And, and, you know, I wish looking back on everything that, that not only would we have taken this more seriously when it happened, um, but but, you know, I mean, I think about it like responsibility wise, you know, I have a responsibility to care for children and families and, and, you know, and to have, you know, someone in my family who has gotten sick, putting absolutely everyone at risk, you know, was for me something that's going to take me a really long time guilt wise to get over because that's the problem with COVID is that you, if you are someone who is a carrier and you infect other people, you will never know if you caused a death for somebody that, that someone else loves. And I think that for me is the, the worst piece of it, not just going through what we went through, you know, 
money. We can make it again. Probably we are startup business people the first time I, you know, but health and, and the health of your family and, and the health of everyone else for, you know, I mean, that's a really big responsibility that I see some people taking very, very lightly. Sorry, that was like a monologue. I didn't mean to, you're supposed to ask me questions. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. Cause I think one of the things that I, I told you before we started recording is I keep hearing from people, um, well, do you know anyone who's had COVID? And it's almost as if like, if you don't know anyone directly, it must not be that serious or something. And these numbers of deaths on that we see on the news just seem not as relevant if you don't know them, which is sad. But I want to know also, how is David doing now? It's more than three months. What's his health like now, you know, three months post COVID? Well, I would say, you know, his health it is, if you look at him, he seems very healthy. If you, if you know my husband too, he's, you know, he has a really great character and he's just this like, you know, everybody loves him. He's, he's somebody that, that gets along really well with others and he's a real like negotiator, you know, and so he's very social and, and very outgoing. I would say, um, you know, if you see him physically, you think that he's fine, but we know inside of our house what, what's really Really going on and and you know first of all you know like emotionally this was really a really scary thing for him that it'll take a long time to get over with because you know in his mind he thought he was going to die he didn't tell us that at the time thank goodness you know but he was absolutely filled with fear and and worried that he was going to leave us without a dad and so that for me was you know I have two little kids who are amazing and and you know, to have him feel like that. And I was just trying to keep going and stay strong for my kids. So, you know, it was like, I got home to the house, I pulled out the CDC standards and started sterilizing everything. I mean, my house was a hospital afterwards to get, because it's so unbelievably contagious. And the thing about how contagious it is, is that you don't even realize it until it's too late, you know, and once you've gone through this and once you've had somebody in your family who's had it and you've seen the damage that it does to other people's families, because now we're at a point in Spain where, you know, California is a little bit more spaced out. For example, people don't live in the, the, the more urban lifestyle like we do, but the second it starts to spread, it doesn't matter how many spaces or acres you have around you, you're still going to get hit with it because you'll touch the railing at the shop on the shopping cart. You'll, you know, you'll not think about it. And then, you know, the, the metal surfaces, I mean, the careful, the, you know, the, the ways that you have to be careful are, are really strong, but you know, David, um, he's having heart problems now. And so one of the side effects, now they're starting to come out with information and they don't know whether it comes from the, the cocktail of drugs that they were just giving people when it first happened because it was a combination of the drugs used for malaria and HIV. So that was kind of the cocktail he had. And now I think it's probably evolved to something else because doctors had to react so fast. Nobody knew what to do. And so um, he has uh, what do you call heart palpitations. And so he gets like, you know, rapid heart things and freaks out that he's having a heart attack. Um, really weird thing. Like his feet and his hands are really dry. They're like sandpaper. Um, but then there are other pieces of it, like memory loss, you know, or, you know, random things like trying, he would, he would try to remember his bank codes right after he got out of the hospital, he wanted to pull money out of uh, an ATM and he couldn't remember his bank code completely blank forgot that. Um, you know, so there, uh, he has trouble breathing still. And so today, for example, he went to a nutritionist to put himself on, on a, on a healthy diet because there was an, a great article yesterday in the New York times, I think it was that talks about the side effects that we're now seeing in, in COVID patients after the fact. And so, and they're pretty common, you know, that just like when they figured out that people who have COVID, you know, for example, the smells, the, the, the not being able to smell, that was, I had that. And I, at the time, nobody knew all anybody was looking for in the beginning was just a fever, you know? And, um, and so, so yeah, health wise, he, he, he has to go to the doctor. He has to take really good care of himself. Um, lucky, luckily, David is healthy you know, he was healthy before. And so that makes all the difference. But if anyone has, you know, for me, the worst is, is when you see people who are cancer, you know, who have cancer, 
And you know, you, you can't tell they have cancer when they're walking down the street, but you can certainly, if you pass the infection to them, make sure that somebody loses a family member and you won't even realize it, you know? And so that for me was, was is the hardest part of this, you know? Is all the damage you do to others when you're not careful. You, me, we, all of us, you know, when in the beginning, like, you know, I mean, now I'm, they laugh. I'm a crazy person. We did, we did our testing and we did the antibodies testing and the, whatever you call them, all three of them. And our whole family, my husband and my two kids and me, we all had the antibodies. So we definitely had it. But for example, my symptoms, I, I did, I got a little bit of a cough and it was really, I, it felt like a weird cough, a different cough than usual, but I always get a cough at that time of year. I'm, you know, I work around babies. I work around kids all the time. So it's pretty normal that in flu season, I'm going to get something. And I, I don't know if I had a fever or not. I don't think I ever did. I didn't feel like I had a fever, but I'm always really busy, you know? And so I didn't have the same symptoms that, um, that, that maybe somebody else did. And I think that that I'm the most dangerous person of all, you know, because when you feel like you're okay, you think you're okay. And it's actually the opposite. By the time you realize that you have it, you know, you've already passed it to eight to 15 people, you know, and I think that that's the biggest, it's this, like, we've got to think differently. It's no longer okay to only think about us. And and the, the thing that angers me the most is the fake news that I see, you know, and how the algorithms are playing into all of this. Because if you decide to read an article about a certain thing, I mean, there was a great uh, podcast the other day talking about how the algorithms work. And I know you guys all know this, um, but they talk about how, you know, it's, they know you better than your spouse. They know you better than yourself. And so they start feeding your mentality with more and more negative news. And then you're so engaged, you can't stop reading it. The anger builds, the everything. And so the more fake news that's out there, the more things that people are reading, the more safe that they feel. And even, you know, they pushing against this and being risky. And it's just, it's not right. You know, I mean, I understand like if that's what you want to do and you want to live your life like that, stay home and keep your mask off all day long. But you know, the, that responsibility that you have right now to think about somebody else, it's never been bigger in the world. Never. You know, because this, this, this COVID, it does not, you know, it'll hit anyone and it hits hard when it really does. If somebody like me is lucky enough to have had it and we didn't end up in a hospital, we're just really lucky. But that's not the norm. So what about with your kids? So you know they have the antibodies. Did they have any symptoms at all? My daughter, absolutely none. But Olivia's really you know, she, she'll hold stuff in. And so she could have had it and not even realize that she had it, but we didn't see any signs of a cold, anything. David came out of the hospital. I think, I, I don't remember the days exactly, but near the, the end of March, he was out of the hospital and he was back at home and he had to be in quarantine for about, um, 21 days after being in the hospital, something like that. So he couldn't go out. So all, oh, that's the other thing, moms, all of the work fell on me, all of it. And we live in an apartment, okay? Like, it was really hard to carry those grocery bags back and forth. Anyway, but he, um, he ended up, like, Nico all of a sudden had, um, a, you know, maybe a month after David was home. It was before kids were getting out of quarantine here because kids couldn't leave the houses. And, and it was, like, the day before. And he was going... He wasn't, he had diarrhea for a few days and just his stomach was not well. And he kept complaining about a headache, but it wasn't, you know, he didn't have a fever. He didn't have anything. And then he got stomach pains. And so David said, I'm going to take him to the hospital. And I was like, you guys can't do that. You're not supposed to be out. Like you can't be roaming around, you know, but he insisted and he took Nico to, to get checked. And, um, and they did all this blood work on him, but they didn't do the COVID test. I don't know why. And I thought that was really strange, you know, knowing that David had it, but his blood test, test came back and it seemed like everything was normal. And we just recently did the COVID testing about three weeks ago. And when we did the test, that's where we saw that not only did Nico have the antibodies, he had like 4.6. I mean, you know, I think the average, um, can't remember what it was with the average. I think I had 1.6, you know, and, and so, uh, David, I don't remember what his was. Olivia had 2.8. So we were well above, you know, most people, if they've had COVID, maybe you'll see like 1.2 in the antibodies test or above that. 
and Nico was at like 4.6. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, you know, so kids are the care, you know, they, they carry it and they can be, they can seem really healthy. And we actually had a case of that in our community. So um, when this was all happening and, and, and we didn't find everything out until much later. And we, we did have a family that lost a family member in, in here. And this was a family that had just moved from to Spain from another place and, and not a place on the radar or anything. Um, and the child around January 16th, and I only know this because we had an event that day and we had a, a tech company coming to test out technology with our kids. And they came and we were doing like videos and stuff like that about it. And we were engaging with the kids, how to do smart technology with kids. No? And they, that day, the kid, we were engaging with the child all day and he took a nap. And when he woke up from nap time, he had um, had like, it almost looked like, you know how when kids get chicken pox, sometimes you'll see the little bumps on their stomach in the beginning. It looked like that. And at the time, that was not anything of a symptom. No one was talking about that. So we sent him with his mother directly to the hospital. The hospital did, a, we have a private hospital that works with our school. And the hospital did a checkup. They said everything was absolutely fine and, and that he was okay. So he stayed home from school for a few days. But, um, you know, it turns out later on that his grandmother had it and she passed away. And so we found out maybe two months ago that that's actually now they know that's a symptom of it and so you know it's all the information they're they're inventing it as they go like really we don't know we don't know what this is we don't know if the antibodies mean anything this is a pandemic this is something new and so we really have to we, we have to just err on the side of being really careful because there is a possibility that I could get it again. There's a possibility that, David, you know, we think that we're like, we have a superhero cape because we have the antibodies, but we don't, you know? And so, so until we really know that there's, you know, that we can get rid of this and not by, you know, drinking bleach or whatever, like, I think it's just best to err on the side of being really, really careful. Because you can find out tomorrow that, you know, all the things that we think about COVID have changed. That's how evolved. That's how this thing evolved, you know? Okay. So Jill, I think one of the things, okay, I'm just remembering now back in March, I spoke to you when David was in the hospital, I think, or just getting home. Mm -hmm. And you said something mm -hmm. about, wow, brace yourself. It's going to be bad when it starts spreading in, in America. And I still, you know, that was right before they put us, you know, on kind of our lockdown, which uh -huh. I've told many people was not as um, strict as yours. Um, people were, you know, oh, still yeah. going to the market. That was lockdown fight, you guys. That was nothing. Yeah. Well, which I, I, you know, after talking to you, I was wishing we had done better because now, of course, we're seeing that our, you know, it's kind of everywhere now and things are still going up in like most of our states and everything else. So what is it like now in Spain? Are things, I think you, you have things starting to open up a little bit. Is that correct? Things finally started to open up. But again, I'm with you on the, you know, we've spoken about this before. I was amazed because Spain's a, a tourist country, you know, and so tourism obviously is devastated by this. But what for me gave me the worst feeling, I think like worldwide, probably, I don't know how many people think this, but I could not believe that they had come up with a solution to map out the beaches so that tourists could come. They had the grids mapped out so that you would have your social distancing at the public beach. They prepared to have, you know, um, the, all the big count cultural events. They now, the soccer teams start, no offense, we have a lot of the players who come to our schools, but the soccer team started playing uh, about three weeks ago. They were back. And all of this happened before they even thought about what they were going to do with kids. And, and so, you know, this, the, the thing that, um, I totally got sidetracked with that. Sorry. <laughs> but the thing with, that, that blows me away is how, you know, how they are kind of like these forgotten people in the middle of this. Um, but what the, the, the thing when you were talking about when it hit here, finally, 
it was hard and it was like so fast, you know, and the deaths were just climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing. And, and it was first it hit the population of, of the elderly, you know, because we had a problem when, and it was hitting inside of the residence homes. And there were some, some things that happened, but Spain has a huge elderly population. People, I think we have one of the longest lifespans in the world. And so, and, and the elderly live a very active life and, and it's, so they don't stay home, you know, whereas maybe I think in the States might, you know, you, people are more homebody, so to speak. Um, but, but here the, that, I mean, it just, it wouldn't stop climbing and it was, you know, it got up to, I can't remember how many deaths a day. I'm, and you're going to feel really bad because I, it's all, everything just blurs together, but we have been, we have been probably the strictest lockdown in the world. I would say, I don't know any other countries that did what they did here because it was, you know, police guarding the areas and you were not to move. But yeah, the, the, now we're, we're at a point where there are very few cases. I'm really, I'm kind of worried because things started opening up. So we were allowed to open our schools up on June 22nd, but under severe restrictions. So we'll probably be one of the few that, uh, that will be open. And we had to maintain our online programs because kids need stuff to do, you know, but we have. Uh, we have opened, but we follow CDC standards to a T, you know, and the health and hygiene. You have to be so careful with the cleaning and the maintenance throughout the day. Um, so they, they opened up, and I'm a little worried because last weekend was the first weekend after all of this that people could travel from one community to another. And so everybody took advantage to go away for the weekend because Madrid is hot right now. You know, we're in plain July, you know, and the, and the city life is hot. So, um, so I am a little worried about that. So we had to be extra cautious this whole week after everybody came back from being away from the weekend because that's when it happens. It's when people go to an event. I'm surprised that you're telling me that so many people are saying that I don't know somebody who's had it. That means that the worst is yet to come. Because I'm not, I don't think Spain's just this weird place. Like, you know, it's, you know, I, and it happened to happen. I know we live in an urban city, but what I've seen overall is that, um, you know, when, if you haven't gotten to the point where you don't know somebody who's passed away, your, your city, your state, your country is not there yet. And it will come you know, and everybody might be hopeful that they come up with a vaccine or they come up with some kind of magical medication, which there is no magical medication, you know, if they come up with that. But, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's just easier to think about other people and stay home. You know, I think that that's the, that's the only way let's, we have to put our own needs aside for just a minute. You know, we got so used to having everything and really fast and whenever we wanted it in the way that we wanted it. And I think COVID is kind of teaching us that, you know, we've got to live differently. We have to think about others. This whole me, me, me thing, you know, I'll tell you the one thing I'm like, I get excited about and I shouldn't be, but when I see people finally having the, co the hard conversations with somebody not wearing a mask, it's about time because it is not the responsibility of a poor employee in Starbucks, which I don't know what that guy in Starbucks makes, but not enough money to have to have a hard conversation with a jerk who won't wear a mask. You know, even my whole family, we have passed through this and we have had it. I still wear a mask every time I go out of the house, you know, and because I care about other people. It's not about me anymore. It's about somebody's grandmother. It's about somebody's mother who could have cancer. And I know that for a fact because I have seen it. I have seen people get sick um, who really were already going through illnesses and, and now the, the thing that I'm seeing, and it's happening in the States, so I will imagine that that's probably next year now that they've opened things up, is that it started out and it was the elderly getting sick. And now it's the young people and it's those, you know, big parties. And I get it, like we're social, we want to go out. But I think right now it's the time to work on ourselves, you know, work on, you know, it's hard, but staying home, reading books, learning new stuff. It's kind of like this moment where we need to just take a minute and, and, and live, you know, to make ourselves better because if not, it's only going to get worse. And so fine, you go to a bar in Miami and you're on spring break or wherever, I don't know, wherever, but then you go home and you see your grandma 
or you go home with your friend and he has a mom who's sick and nobody really talks about those like six degrees of separation. Like that's what COVID's about. It's not just about you anymore. And, and even if you think that it's all a hoax and the doctors don't know anything, so what? You know, just live for somebody else for like five minutes. It's not that hard. What are we talking about? We've already done this. We did lockdown for three and a half months. If I can be locked up with my children and my husband in an apartment in the middle of a hot city for three months, I now know I can survive anything. Like seriously, you know, so why not just wait a little bit longer, right? Just a little bit. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm inspired. I wish from, I wish we could all just, like you said, just live a little bit less self-focused. And I think this is probably just the time we're in right now. People, like you said, are so used to getting everything so quickly. We're used to Amazon and our Starbucks drink coming out quickly. And I, like you, hope that from this, we learn that we are a community. We're a global community. What happens over there impacts us. You know, we all have a responsibility. And I think I think what I'm seeing here is people are just tired. You know, the young people are tired of, of not being with their friends. And so they just have decided it's over. <laughs> well, Jill, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I think that, you know, we are behind you uh, guys, timeline wise. And I do not think we have done as good of a job of stopping this. So we're just still kind of in the midst of it over here. And I don't know how much longer it's going to go on. You know, I think a lot now about um, school and what's going to be next year. I have two, two of my kids are teachers and then all the rest are students. And so, you know, that is something that I'm seeing that, you know, our actions now and our actions over the past few months are definitely impacting the future. So thanks for your wisdom. Thanks for coming on and sharing. And we'll check back in and hopefully see you guys thriving over there in Madrid and in Spain and healthy and COVID free in really soon. Um, and hopefully you can show us the way. You guys, you can do it. You can do it. If you can't stay home, wear a mask, hand sanitizer. And, and, you know, I encourage you, I know some people say no, but wear gloves, you know, and, and I still wear gloves when I go everywhere. And I'm just really careful about you know, not touching my face and not doing all those things because when, you know, we have both David's parents and my, my mom has finally gotten here after a whole, a whole story and we had to bring her here on an emergency visa before they denied American travel to Europe. And, um, and so my mom, you know, she hasn't had it and she was, so we have to be really careful when we go home, you know, about making sure that she doesn't get it because we do not want I can't be without a mom right now. It was bad enough, everything else. But if I have to deal with that too, I don't know. I probably will fall apart. <laughs> well, we're sending you positive thoughts from over here and sad that we don't get to see you and your family this summer. But thanks so much for sharing. I, am, I love watching you singing and dancing and staying positive despite all the hardships you have faced. And boy, you're really demonstrating some great resilience for your kids. So good job, Jill. Thank you so much for joining me for this week's conversation with Jill Stripling of English for Fun in Madrid, Spain. I really appreciate Jill's honesty, resilience, and positivity during COVID, and I left our conversation feeling inspired. I hope you also feel inspired to persevere and be resilient through this crisis. My favorite this week is a book that rose to the top of my anti-racism syllabus for this summer after I heard her interviewed on Brene Brown's Unlocking Us podcast. Austin Channing Brown is the author of I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. I had many takeaways from the book, which I wrote about in a review that's available on my website, and I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode. But one of the main takeaways is that just being around, working with, living with, and being friends with Black people is not enough. We need to push for deep, transformative, and just relationships. And we need to seek to be part of communities and places of work where Black people are in positions of power and leadership. 
I read I'm Still Here on my Kindle and highlighted over 140 passages that I wanted to look back on after I read it. I've also heard that the audio version is really good and that Austin narrates it herself. So that's my favorite for this week. As always, you can find notes, links, and other resources related to today's conversation by visiting my website at sunshine-parenting.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for my email list so that you don't miss out on any of the great resources I have available for raising thriving kids. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate you sharing it with a friend. Please take a moment to give Sunshine Parenting a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's end with a quote from my book, Happy Campers. Creating a close and connected family culture that promotes positive, lifelong relationships is the most important thing we can do for our children. Warm and supportive parent-child relationships, a sense of being loved, and help and support from family members serve as protective factors and increase children's resilience and their ability to face many of life's inevitable challenges. I'm Audrey Monkey. Thank you for joining me for the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. Join me again next week for more conversations about raising kids who become thriving adults.